from Flourish DX, this is the Psych Health and Safety Canada podcast. With workplace mental health becoming a priority for businesses who want to retain staff and prevent burnout, this is the source of information for creating sustainable and psychologically healthy workplaces in Canada. Welcome to Psych Health and Safety in Canada podcast. And today I get to welcome uh, a friend of at least a decade, maybe more than that now, Francois. Um, Francois Legault was served on the technical committee for the development of the standard with me. And I could go through a litany of uh, his CV, but instead I'm going to turn it over to you, Francois, to describe your journey to how you got to where you are today. You mean to uh, to be a chicken farmer and, uh, <laughs> and a forester and a maple syrup producer? <laughs> are those are those uh, your side hustles now? My side hustles, hobbies, uh, <laughs> my uh, self care plan. I'm very good. Plan. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the uh, invitation and uh, for your uh, your continued uh, uh, mission. <laughs> that you have taken on so many years uh, ago and uh, continue to do uh, such a great job at uh, Marianne. Um, so yeah, my, my journey, well, you know, I don't wanna go too far back. I'm 63 right now, so I don't wanna go too far, but I would say that um, in the context of, um, of uh, experience, I would say that um, because I'm a social worker, and, um, as you uh, know very well, we in our field are very concerned with a multitude of factors and uh, factors that you know I- impress upon people's health and well welfare and wellness, and uh, and some of those obviously you know occur in the workplace. The workplace is is in a way a microcosm of society, so we just can't escape it. These these um, factors come in play, and and uh, there's a barrage of them in our lives. And so, um, I became interested in in uh, workplace mental health. Uh, I guess back as far as 1985, when I started doing some em- employee assistance program counseling. So as an EAP counselor or an EFAP, as a matter of fact, the, the EAP I was um, I was working for at that time was a, a both an employee and a family um, assistance program. When uh, at a time where um, EAPs were were not necessarily extended to family members, so it was pretty progressive back then. Nineteen eighty five. That's a long time ago. Uh, the big hair, the big hair um, decade, and. Um, we, um, uh, where I was working in Northern Ontario, um, I was just amazed at this whole concept. It, it really opened my mind to, you know, like here we are helping people with, uh, in the agency where I work was a family service a- agency. And uh, we were dealing with a multitude of several problems, layers of, of problems and pathologies in some cases uh, to help these these people sort of climb back out of the hole that they found themselves in. And and when I started uh, working with people who were employed and concerned about, you know, maintaining their employment, concerned about maintaining their income and stability for themselves and their family, it was a very refreshing and exciting kind of work, much more towards prevention and um, and uh, early intervention as opposed to um, you know attacking the problem when when things have exacerbated and just got so bad that uh, people came to see us um, with very little hope of getting better. So um, capitalizing on hope and and capacity and energy and, and, and working with those people sort of opened my mind too. There's a lot that we can do around workplace mental health. After many years of doing EAP on the side, uh, not on a full-time basis, um, I got interested in doing it full-time and I did that. Uh, I was working in uh, Montreal. I was in charge of our trauma response team. 
uh, for a large uh, corporate EAP in the private sector. Um, and um, uh, I learned a lot from that process as well, you know, how we could, for example, intervene after um, uh, incidents, workplace incidents, accidents, um, near death experiences, uh, holdups in banks, and and by our psychoeducational approach, we might be able to prevent uh, things from getting a lot worse for these people, and return as faster, let's say, to a normal normalcy and and return to uh, a better equilibrium and balance in their lives uh, shortly after something that was obviously very traumatic and, and disruptive uh, for themselves. Um, and, um, and from then, I mean, you know, um, it opened the mind of like, what else can we do from an educational standpoint that might actually make a big difference in workplaces? And what a great audience to have, you know, when, when you're, you're in school, and I, I have uh, two uh, young adults, teenagers, sort of in between teenagers and adults right now. And, and you know, they, they were uh, initiated to mental health um, in their uh, primary school and, uh, and secondary school. And um, I wasn't, I certainly wasn't. My generation, we rarely talked about that. So so that was kind of exciting to see as well that, you know, educational uh, impact can start very young with, with folks normalizing and validating things. And uh, at the point, I think now, after being involved in EAP uh, for 40 years, uh, almost 40 years, um, um, people see it, you know, I, I'm not faced with the same sort of hesitancy about calling for help. Um, when I mention that as a possible resource to, to my own individual clients, or if I'm doing uh, training programs um, like Mental Health First Aid or The Working Mind, uh, two products uh, that are developed by the Mental Health Commission of Canada. So, so uh, there's a barrage, there's, there's like a, a plethora almost of, of different initiatives that are going on now that's, that are so exciting. And, compared to the very few um, initial workshops that I remember um, developing uh, in, in Northern Ontario for families and individuals. And I was lucky if five people in the community showed up to those workshops because mental health was mentioned or because it was a social worker who was uh, presenting uh, this workshop. Now, um, you know, I've delivered 160 mental health first aid courses, um, most of them now virtually since the pandemic, actually, and uh, and the working mind, uh, 60 or more of those, and uh, and develop specific uh, workshops on demand for a variety of different organizations. And I do this as a consultant now because um, my uh, my career has started in the community in private sector, employee assistance programs, back to community mental health programs for about seven years. And then um, a major catastrophe happened in Canada that uh, um, it was the, the Swiss air disaster. And I was called um, because of my um, background and expertise in, in trauma response to, uh, to go and help uh, at Peggy's Cove and uh, Halifax and Dartmouth and um, and was called back to do uh, one to two weeks at a time uh, on the ground field um, critical incident stress um, uh, interventions and uh, worked uh, with, with groups there on the ground with teams and became a team leader and and uh, that was a very exciting time as well from a career standpoint learning more about like what would be the psychosocial disaster management aspects that we would need to to develop as well and and the employers of course were the ones asking for that help so how do we work with the employers what else what other factors might contribute to those individuals um, preventing those individuals from from uh, from a whole variety of different stress and we know that stress is cumulative so so i was very interested in um, when we uh, through the Mental Health Commission, started talking of, as an advisory group um, 
um, advisory committee member with yourself started looking at like, you know, is there room for a standard that would actually look at psychological health and safety and what other factors um, uh, organizations could bolster that would actually act as, well, to minimize and to reduce the irritants in the workplace and other uh, stressors, but also um, protect uh, protection, uh, protective factors. What would be the protective factors that uh, would uh, compensate for those factors that, that as an organization or as an employer, you have very little control over? And it's a long and winding road, Francois. So um, my curiosity, I'm doing work this year on trauma prevention. And so I'd love to hear more about what you think an employer can do besides having um, services that are provided. What could be done in the workplace to be trauma-informed, but more importantly, to be trauma like it, to prevent the worst effects from exposure to traumatic incidents. Right, we learned we learned a lot from the Swiss Air disaster, and <clears throat> when I say we, we're, I'm still connected to a, a core group of people who were involved back in 1998, 1999, to the incident, and. Uh, um, and every time we, we we get together as a as a voluntary national psychosocial emergency team on a, on a yearly basis, we we go back to some of those learning um, opportunities. One of those was was uh, noticing that when you uh, overexposure people uh, over a period of time, um, you're pretty sure that you're going to have some problems. Uh, they're going to have problems, and the organization will have problems delivering whatever they're supposed to do. Um, uh, in, in Swiss Air, without going into gory details, you know, folks were in contact with, um, with de debris, uh, over a million parts of that plane. And in, in those parts, there were uh, human uh, remains that needed to be uh, segregated and separated uh, for ritualistic, religious, and, and uh, just humane, uh, kind of treatment, and so, so a lot of folks were exposed to to a whole bunch of stuff that were, that were very uh, disturbing for the average individual. And so, um, just thinking about uh, establishing an emergency response plan to a to an event that might happen in your workplace, and who would be the best people to do this, and then how to prevent uh, having the same person or same small group of people. Uh, literally uh, overexpose themselves to that. Uh, how do you contain the uh, communication around that so that um, they don't um, um, expose other people uh, by sharing what they've witnessed uh, and so on and so forth. So rotating teams, for example, if you know you're gonna be involved in a long uh, exposure to, to a phenomenon like a, a plane crash or an accident, do you need to have 25 people there? You know, there was an incident in, in Armbrier where um, I think it was in the media. A lot of folks heard about it. It was a grandpa with three kids that died in a, a car accident. And they were hit by um, uh, um, an intoxicated driver, which often is the case, who survived. And uh, but um uh, several ambulances were called, um, not just a few um, firefighters and police. And so there were like a lot of folks that were exposed to this when in fact the accident already happened. Is it necessary to have 17 people exposed to this in detail? Um, and what happened was that there was a very high number of those individuals who um, took uh, sick leave um, and some long-term. Uh, disability as a result. So organizations also need to think about that. Uh, you know, we were like 70 counselors that were called across the country to go to Swiss Air. And um, some of us were very <laughs> adventurous in, uh, in, in, uh, in our field work and would uh, go out of our way to get to see some of the details. 
and to inquire about those details. Is it really necessary to get into the weeds here with individuals? Do we need to almost re-traumatize them by asking those questions? And some of those counselors had to be sent home um, because they weren't sleeping anymore. They weren't functioning anymore. And they were in a loop of just like talking about what they saw over and over and over again, and obviously not uh, not a healthy pattern. And they, you know, it's again like the uh, the cobbler without you know, cobbler's kids don't have shoes kind of thing. You know, you're a counselor, you're trained in trauma, and here you are just doing what you should be doing. So we were still very much learning back in 1999, and uh, I think. Uh, organizations need to have that plan, emergency response plan. If something goes wrong, how do we deal with it? Uh, who do we call? Who's going to be in charge? It's not uh, it's not enough to just send people out there. You need to have somebody like really coordinate this. So an emergency response coordinator within organizations. Now, of course, I'm talking about large organizations. Mom and pop shops don't have that sort of capacity, but sometimes they have common sense. That large organizations may not have because everything is so compartmentalized, you know? So the owner might just think, you know, I'll do it, you know, keep the business running and I'll do it. Or I'll call upon one person and I don't have the staff to mobilize everybody anyway. So, but those are some of the, the lessons learned is, is don't overexpose your people. If you have to expose people, think about a rotation. Think about also decompression. After people are actually doing really hard stuff, exposing themselves to a lot of stress, whether it's trauma stress or whether it's like the public health uh, folks, you know, being spat at and uh, threatened and videotaped and challenged and yelled at at airports and land borders right now. That's a lot of, you know, and, and if and they have nowhere to complain about it because if they talk to the general public, you know, people are going to say they don't understand. And they may not even uh, be against the healthcare measures that are in place. So, so it's a bit like the Vietnam War veteran who comes back and then is booed and called a baby killer. You know, like uh, he's already traumatized and he's not getting any support. So some of those frontline people, like people working in hospitals that were threatened, their lives were threatened by people during this pandemic. That's an, kind of that example. They don't feel the support. They don't feel that people recognize the value of their work. Um, they, it's thankless, uh, yet it is so life protecting, you know, it's so, it's a war against the virus. These, these are warriors that are not respected as well as they should be for the work they're doing. So that's another factor that just exacerbates everything. So how does an organization make sure that they get the public support, educate the, 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 the recipients of the services they're getting? by the reason behind it. How is that communicated? How is that well communicated? And, and how do we encourage people to support our folks, our employees? So, you know, one of the surveys that we did this year said that 35% of all Canadians reported um, being burned out, but 66% of nurses did. So one of the things that you said is decompression, which you and I both know, um, we can deal with a lot if we've got those times where we can decompress and we can come back and deal with something else. But in nursing, um, for many years, never mind through the pandemic, the idea that there would be time on a shift to decompress or even time to say, oh, I'll just call in sick is not the reality. So what would be your advice to uh, nurses who are looking for some sort of balance and they are traumatized um, sometimes daily. Oh yeah, absolutely. There's the issue of resources too that uh, I, I think you're probably alluding to as well. <laughs> you know, if you don't have the resources, you're already overworked and, uh, and you have some team cohesion, what's gonna happen is you're gonna feel terribly guilty for calling in sick as well. And uh, so, so, you know, you might be staying at home sick, but you're going to feel guilty, which just, you know, undoes, you know, what just sabotages your rest. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so a lot of folks would rather just, you know, work through it and push through it, hoping that, you know, soon they'll have a break, 
And uh, that's, that's part of the reason why um, there's so much burnout is it's unsustainable to run a marathon like a sprint. <laughs> you just can't do it. And so uh, organizations need to, to think about that. I, it's a real hard, like hard for, for, for hospitals and uh, when they're short staffed, uh, they have problems with budgets and resources. Uh, they can't recruit fast enough for the um, retirement cohort. You know, um, I'm a baby boomer, so I know like a lot of us have just exited and some of us are still working uh, uh, as consultants and stuff and on occasion on a part time basis. But um, a lot of them are we, you know, thank you know, it's like retirement and that's it. I'm out of here. And so, um, you know, knowledge retention down the drain. Um, and so there's a lot of factors involved. But one interesting project that was done with OMA, I, I believe, Ontario Medical Association, was to um, a pilot a program where they um, encourage people to take um, many five-minute mindful meditation breaks during the day for, uh, for doctors and, and nurses, I, I suppose, as well. And um, they do a sort of little workshop on how to do it. It includes deep breathing, of course, uh, which we know is the, the fastest way mm. to uh, lower your blood pressure and, um, and uh, clear the, the mind uh, so you can uh, have a better focus. But to be able to do it several times during the day. So for the, the person driving to work, if they can avoid driving to work and actually like being in, in the bus or on a train or in a, in a Uber or whatever, they can do the mindfulness meditation before they go to work. They can do it at uh, their breaks. Um, they can be encouraged to take breaks more often by having a break coordinator. So I remember running a shop that was dealing with a lot of suicide calls, like at a crisis uh, center. And what we did was we, we had folks that were break coordinators. They would like insist, okay, you got to take your break. Come on. Let's go let's go for a break so you would go for a break in pairs um you wouldn't be left alone to take your break and that would allow some some chit chat talk about the weekend hobbies like change your brain focus on something else that in itself is helpful and and if and if you i'm thinking now uh, you know because you've asked the question if you can incorporate some of the learning from that oma project to do these, these quick five-minute deep breathing and uh, mindfulness moments. Or even if you have to go to the washroom and you can do it there. You know, you can do it walking outside uh, while you're going for a coffee. Um, so clearing, learning how to clear your mind and learning how to get into a meditative state while you're just simply walking, while you're, you're taking a deep breath and doing it several times a day um, is very helpful. The other thing that I was just reading on um, is music. And we all know that there's a long history of people who have suffered under duress, stress, slavery, um, wars that have used music to calm themselves down. Uh, veterans in the First World War, you know, they, they do decompression and R&R. &R. They would go back away from the front and, uh, well, they would drink a lot. But they would also go in pubs and they'll, they'd sing. And they, they, as a group, they would just sing together as a group. And research shows that there's a lot of release of oxytocin when that happens. And there's bonding that occurs in team building and uh, com camaraderie and all these very positive factors that occur through uh, uh, creative activity, whether it's singing together, whether it's, it's doing something that has nothing to do with your job and your responsibilities. So those are some of the ideas that I'm just throwing out there, but there's so much research now, neuropsychological research on the brain and how we organize thought and, and, uh, and how we rest the brain. Now we're really looking into it. So there's, this is an exciting time. I think there's, there's probably a lot of opportunities to uh, incorporate in very busy schedules some of these uh, techniques. Yeah, that's great, Francois. There's two things that um, I've learned about the experience of trauma in the moment um, from a lot of the literature and, and different people who have had the experience. 
One is that in the moment of a traumatic incident, we can often make a decision, come to a conclusion or make an assumption, often about the safety of the world at large or about ourselves. And that that thought gets so buried in the days that follow that trying to understand why we feel a certain way when we can't remember what the thought was uh, Mm -hmm. makes recovery very difficult. And so um, just any thoughts about what happens in the mind in the moment that you know of? Well, we know that we restore trauma in a place where the cells are the last ones to die. So, you know, I, I remember working in a, in a group home, um, in a, a home for the aged uh, setting once. And I was involved in behavior management, which is another training that I got in, in community mental health. And I would go uh, to, to do assessments um, with people who had behavior problems and a lot of it related to dementia. And um, I had a beard um, a bit longer than, than now. And uh, as I walk into this hallway, there's this little old lady, uh, frail looking old lady, strapped to a, a leather chair, um, jerry chairs, they used to call them, the geriatric chairs. And it was like physical constraints because I guess she, she would get into trouble or whatever, I don't know. But as I walk in there, all of a sudden she starts yelling and cursing and swearing, like <laughs> just just surprised me. This little frail lady was just like losing it, uh, enraged while looking at me. And I, I kept looking behind me saying like, is there somebody that she's angry with? Like, is it me? And a nurse came by and she just pushed me out, out of her eyesight and the yelling stopped. And then when I, oh, I said, oh, good. And when I tried to get back, the nurse said, no, 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 no. Let me turn the chair around. Because if she sees you, and if she sees any man with a beard, she behaves that way. So her long-term memory of probably trauma that happened and that she was a victim of, we think, anyway, and the nurse thought as well, would be triggered. And uh, because she had very little short-term memory, as soon as that stimulant, I guess I was the stimulant in this case, SNR, well, her reaction stopped because she couldn't remember why she was upset. So we know that trauma is lodged there and it just stays there. And it's in a very primitive form. So perhaps it was initiated by a thought. Perhaps it was initiated by a questioning of my security at a time where I always thought I was secure up until I was witness to this event. But it's it's stored in there. And then the whole system, hormonal system of alert and defensiveness is triggered. And it doesn't necessarily shut off mm-hmm. on its own. I don't know so, if I'm answering your question. But. Yeah. So is there anything that we can do immediately to make it less likely that it gets stuck. Well, the the the, the technique that um, that uh, Mitchell developed, which was you know the uh, now antiquated, it's almost antiquated, mm-hmm. the critical incident stress management, still practiced by many first responders, was created by a fireman who witnessed uh, a bride uh, being killed by a, a, an electric post that just you know fell on her uh, as she's leaving in a convertible with all the, you know, and it's just married in the back and and she has all those cans at the back and, and all of a sudden an accident happens and she's impaled and dies. He couldn't function for a while. And he decided he was gonna study psychology to try to get some, some uh, knowledge of why has this impacted me so well, so much that I, I can't function anymore. And so he, he got his PhD and developed critical incident stress management, which was very narrowly focused on how do I help my colleagues um, develop a narrative of some sort or develop a way to, to take that information and put it in a safer place in that brain a place where, you know, it, it makes sense. 
um, this happen, doesn't happen, you know, and being able to put it, first of all, in the uh, prefrontal cortex of our brain, which is the logical and thinking one, and then allow that brain to sort of connect with these other more primitive parts of our brain that might still be sending messages of, you know, danger, danger, you know, be on alert. Um, um, and, and so by having a group of peer being able to talk about this and support each other, normalize the reaction so that you don't think you're going crazy. This is just a normal self-survival mechanism that's triggered by this event. And it's normal for me to not sleep, to not function very well, to be irritable, to be impatient, to be jerky, to, uh, to, uh, to sometimes become more aggressive than I would normally be. This is just my self-defense mechanisms on full alert, and they don't need to be, but it's going to get better. And it's going to get better with understanding by others and then understanding by myself. So that's how the group process um, I think was instrumental to that, uh, that debriefing. They used to call it a group debriefing, right? A CISD, which was then found to be revolutionary. And then people tried to apply it to everything, mm -hmm. including, uh, um, you know, uh, burn victims. They even tried it on burn victims, you know, on an individual basis with no peer support. And they didn't find that as helpful. Of course not. Anybody who studied um, uh, group work, like my specialty as a master's level is social group work. So right off the bat, you know the benefits of group work. And so to try to even think about doing it individually and use the same techniques, that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So we had to sort of realize that it can work in a very specific kind of um uh, workplace and profession. And once you start mixing the professions, it doesn't seem to work as well. Either. No, I remember um, hearing uh, uh, research out of McMaster University talk about that when that process um, was facilitated incorrectly, it actually could increase um, incidence of post-traumatic stress disorder because it was almost like saying, well, if you don't feel upset, maybe there's something wrong with you. you need to. Yeah, you need to be traumatized by this. It's they they didn't validate the feelings; they validated that you should feel this way. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's fascinating. It, it, it has to yeah, it has to start with. Not all of us are going to react the same way to this. Right. Not all of us will be impacted to the same degree. Yeah. Um, and so you got to start with that even before you even tackle the discussion. Yeah. An another piece that came to me about trauma actually first was um, uh, something that Stéphane Grenier said, our mutual friend, Stéphane Grenier. Right. And it was that um, you can experience something traumatic and be able to move forward Unless somebody suggests, including yourself, that you could have, should have done something different, and then that sense of self-doubt or even shame sets in mm -hmm. and really holds you to that trauma. Can absolutely. you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we know the brain, the primitive part of our brain has no concept of time. That's why a lot of folks, like people who will write about it and different authors will, will encourage, you know, you have to talk to your, the child inside of you. Well, that child inside of you is, is a bit of a, a wild animal that has no concept of time. And so to, to retroactively start thinking about what could I have done differently? What are the lessons learned from this mistake? Which often is like part of a, an organizational debrief after an incident can be uh, can do a lot of damage. Um, people need to, to be very careful about that. Absolutely. Um, people will naturally feel, you know, guilt. This goes beyond survivor, survivor's guilt, you know, where you think, well, how come I was able to survive? And the mm -hmm. others didn't. We know that that has an impact on people. But it gets tremendously 
worsen if all of a sudden they said, I should have done something. The polytechnic uh, murders that occurred several years ago, on December 14th, some several years ago, was, uh, was like that. And several, um, as you know, the, 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 uh, <clears throat> the assassin um, separated women from the men and got the men to leave the classroom and then started shooting at the women. Well, the, some of the guys that were, you know, threatened at gunpoint to leave the classroom, they didn't do so well afterwards. Yeah, so, feeling yeah. like they could have or should have done something different. Absolutely. And yet, logically and speaking, they probably just would have been shot. Right. And at least three of them, you know, died by suicide not mm. that long after. And the sister of the guy who shot the girls also killed herself. Mm. Yeah. And so, yeah, uh, understanding that. Um, mm. Once a traumatic event has taken place, it doesn't serve anybody um, to carry around shame or blame. That, uh, yeah, which is which is tough, right? To just say, "Oh no, let it go and move on with your life." But it's, uh, yeah, it's a difficult thing. It's okay. A difficult thing, yeah. Our, our topics have gotten really heavy here, Francois. So <laughs> let's let's. Uh, Two social let, workers talking. What, what I, I know talk? it's it's a dangerous <laughs> thing, isn't it? Um, when the, we're so fascinated by all aspects of humanity, and you know um, who we are in crisis, and who we are in joy, and who we are uh, on an everyday basis. Um, but let's talk a bit. Because, uh, as I said, you were involved with the development of the standard from the very beginning. You're still involved. And uh, if you can share a bit about what was the journey like from your perspective to develop the national standard on psychological health and safety? And where do you think it's going to go now? Oh, you know, it was... It... <laughs> It almost felt surreal that uh, I remember at the beginning, you know, that just thinking even at those uh, preliminary uh, meetings that uh, you yourself orchestrated uh, with the Great West Life uh, funding, you know, where we even talked about the concept of a standard and started talking about a business case. So already thinking, you know, how do we how do we sell this idea? Like, will organizations be interested in investing time and money and and resources on this, like uh, what's what's the catch? What's the ROI? You know, the return on investment and all that kind of stuff. And and there were some documents and economical sort of analyses that were done, and so on and so forth. Uh, and and the focus was very much, you know, from that angle. And um, it almost felt like, wow, you know, what are the odds that organizations are really want to go go down this path? And then. Uh, CSA group and BNQ um, with with some multi layered funding were were able. BNQ is Bureau de Normalisation du Québec, which is similar to CSA group for those that don't know. Um, and they they work together. Um, you know, I don't think it has happened very often that CSA and BNQ work together on this. And so they're a very exciting time. Very much a pan national or national Canadian way of doing things. And um, so very exciting, you know, like I, I just felt privileged to be at the table with all these very knowledgeable experts. Some expertise had to do with occupational health and safety. Others were like how to build a standard, you know, and um, and had had experience doing so at technical committees before. Um, very rich uh, exchange of ideas and a very, very uh, uh impressive group of people around the table. I almost felt like maybe I'm, you know, do I really have something to contribute? <laughs> you know, was my thought, you know, other than, you know, I, if I hang around long enough, maybe I will, you know, have something that I can contribute or at least in the implementation portion of it uh, because of my experience in, in uh, running programs and uh, being a boss. And I'll, uh, I'll with, tell you a little secret. The, yeah. Most of us, felt that way it that it was surreal because we knew we were making history while we were making it which was a bizarre thing i'd never experienced in my life before but also i think most of us were in awe 
of the caliber of people around the table. And I think most of us had that imposter syndrome, like, well, yeah. how, how am I playing in this sandbox? <laughs> Come on, you know, do they really want me here? Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's interesting because I'm sure from an outsider looking in, they'd think we were all these competent, confident, um, maybe even in times arrogant <laughs> contributors who just, um, you know, felt like we were all king of the hill. And uh, it, it's just not the way humans are. And no. um, the ones uh, I've come to learn that the people who sound the most arrogant, um, constantly bragging and bringing attention to what they do are often the ones with the greatest sense of insecurity, but that we all have that. And I've talked to people that you would think are at the top of their game and still feel that. So it's an interesting human reality. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's, we, we all have more to learn, you know, it's a con continuous improvement kind of uh, curve for, for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. So your question also had to do with, we're, we're, you know, um, the evolution of it. I, I had some some thoughts to that question when you you sort of pointed it out earlier, and it had to do with how interesting it was. Then you know to start from thinking about business case to now the conversations that I'm having with organizations that are seeking my advice and support um, is not about whether we should implement it or not. But you know, since 2013, we know many organizations, including you know BCE, was the first one to say yay, uh, I'm doing something about this and uh, and challenging all the other uh, companies in Canada to do the same, which was, you know, a big moment, a big moment um, and, and well orchestrated around this uh, release of the, the standard. But then from there on, you know, like studies and third parties, Deloitte Touche study, you know, and so that whole question of ROI, return on investment, you know, is pretty well settled. Now it's more like, how do we implement this uh, the fastest way, the cheapest way? Um, how do we uh, measure the progress that we're making? Uh, you know, uh, after the fact, we didn't really think about it, you know, uh, before, but now how do we measure it now? Um, what can we do like around these other workplace factors that we seem to have very little control over? Because there are some workplace factors, you know, like if you're a police officer, there's the public is out of, you know, like how the public responds to you is largely out of your control. There could be some influence that the organization can, can play here, but uh, you know, the results, you know, when you're dealing with public, like the public health nurses, like the nurses in hospitals, they, they, these are factors that are beyond their control. So how do you compensate for that? Like, what can you do in-house that will actually make, make a difference? Um, so that's the kind of dialogue that's happening now. And the very exciting thing that I've been involved in recently was um, being uh, performing psychological first aid, you know, which sort of replaced the old SISM uh, approach, doing PFA um, on site in, uh, in, in the field, field PFA with uh, health providers and being there, like embedded with them and engaging in conversations and doing uh, walkabouts and uh, doing uh, uh, consultation when, when asked, uh, and, um, sharing some ideas, how to better, uh, how to maintain resilience or how to become more resilient to certain stressors, um, engaging conversations about self-care and what works for you. Uh, have you tried this? You know, that kind of stuff that we can do on the field and making sure that they have enough access to water, and um, and they take their breaks and all that kind of stuff, you know, and point out uh, uh, how, um, you know, once they get home, how do how do you decompress and ask, the, you know, have them sort of think about planning <clears throat> post work sort of activities that re uh, re-energizes them and connects them to to people and how to not talk about work all the time, not think about it and how to improve your sleep and all that kind of stuff. So doing that. And uh, listening to people, what started popping up was workplace irritants. So very like the, the term, you know, was being used and, uh, and they weren't using workplace factors, but it's the same kind of thing. And what was interesting was that management started asking, can you send us a report about what you think we could do 
to lessen the stress on employees. And I said, hallelujah. <laughs> so then, so then uh, you, can, you can imagine my response to that. So what I did is, I, you know, I, I don't even know if it was my idea or not, but we started using the colors, you know, like green, uh, yellow, orange, and red. And I put a nice sort of report on Excel spreadsheet and I would, or I can't even remember what model it was, but somebody developed a model and I just kept using it with those colors. And I would say, you know, here are some of the workplace factors that have been improved since last week. And they were in the yellow, uh, in the green. And, and in the yellow were some of your employees are still thinking that this is an irritant and would much appreciate it if this wasn't happening anymore. <laughs> like delays in getting paid, for example, that occasionally happened, but not all the time. And then in orange would be like something that's more common that almost all employees are talking about as an irritant and identifying it as an irritant. It could be parking. Like, why do I have to park so far that at 11 o'clock PM, I have to walk alone to my car, example. And then finally red, like things that are clearly um, an irritant, like uh, people yelling at them, uh, people with pickets and, and uh, throwing uh, things at them as they walk into to work, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. So, so, I, so then I would send that to management, you know, protecting all folks from being identified, of course. Um, and it was appreciated by some. I was dealing with different regional folks, so some regions just loved it. And other regions weren't too crazy about it. And I even had one region say, could you stop sending that to me, please? And I said, I could. However, your boss at the national level wants it. So what do I do? Oh, he says, oh, my. So I could just see the guy stressing out, you know, like, God, you're sending this to my boss, you know? And so <laughs> I said, he's the one that asked for it. I'm sharing it with you so you know exactly where it's going and, and who's seeing it. So that was putting pressure on the bosses to do something about those irritants as well. So the good thing was as a consultant, I was ready to get canned anytime, I didn't care, but I wanted them to get that information and it's continued. So that has been embraced by management and many, many improvements have been done in the workplace on factors that are under the control of the employer. That's great. Yeah, really, because that is the point, right? Is um, we, I know you and I have talked about this before, but the rush to survey that people just want to give another employee survey out there. And yet the real work comes when you get the results and you take action. And if you're not going to take action, you got to stop just asking employees for their opinion and never respecting it at all. So, exactly. yeah, uh, um, I see we're already starting to run out of time. And I've got a couple more things that I want to cover with you. I think you're going to have to come back, Francois, at, at another time. And that's my punishment. Yeah, that's right. That's right. For being interesting, that's your punishment. Um, but I want you to describe what it feels like, especially because we've been talking about trauma and we've been talking about first responders. What would it feel like to be in a workplace that is psychologically healthy and safe, even though you're going to get exposed to traumatic incidents? I think it's very moving, you know, that, that and I hear it from some of, like, because I'm not an employee anymore, but I hear it from, from some of the folks I have individual time with uh, following their decompression period, you know. And they, um, some of them come from the private sector. Some of them have worked in, in other settings. Um, so they've had the experience. I think that's very important. Having the experience of not being listened to, being left on your own, uh, lack of structure, lack of clarity of, of what is expected of you, um, and being blamed when things go wrong. So that's sort of like the description of the worst place in the world to work, right? We know mm -hmm. that, and we've probably experienced it. I've experienced it a couple of times myself uh, at the beginning of my career, and, and not so much beginning, and midstream as well. So once you've experienced that, all of a sudden, when you 
you hit the jackpot. It feels like the jackpot when uh, you're listened to. People are actually wanting to know how you're doing. Um, they're saying, how can I help you? Uh, <laughs> uh, is it some, is there, if you had, you know, so you, you have complaints, I want to hear them. Who wants to hear complaints? Well, a good boss, a good supervisor, a good team leader wants to hear the complaints. If you don't hear the complaints, you can't do a thing about it. And people will just continue to, to uh, you know, simmer in that pot until they're completely boiled, right? That's the boiling frog thing. So you have to hear the complaints. You have to invite them and thank them for sharing that. And then you say, if I had just one, if you had just one wish, if I were your genie, I had just one wish, which of these things would you want me to fix? And some bosses actually do that. And, and I'm hearing that from folks and they're saying, I'll follow this boss anywhere they go. Like this is the best, best person I've ever worked for. And, um, and it takes a lot of maturity and capacity and understanding and this openness that nothing's perfect, but it doesn't mean that we have to give up on trying to improve things. That's great. That's great. I want to go work to that place. My boss is just completely in unreasonable because <laughs> I'm self-employed. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah. And it, um, Francois, if somebody wanted to get in touch with you um, for your consulting services, for uh, your workshops, for any yeah. of the things you provide, how would they find you? Well, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm also, they can also uh, communicate uh, with me through uh, my email. And, um, and that's consultactioninc at gmail.com. So it's in one word, consultaction, I-N-C as in incorporation, and uh, at gmail.com. Um, they can also visit uh, a website. I've got a website. It, I don't use it a lot and it needs to be refreshed, but it's a consult dash uh, or iPhone, I should say, consult iPhone action, Inc. Inc. Uh, at biz.com. Oh, I'm sorry. At, uh, see, I don't use it very often. Um <laughs> uh, it's not dot com. It's uh, dot biz. So consult action inc dot biz. E -I -Z. Consult dash action inc at biz. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's great. E -I -Z. Um, so thank you so much for joining me. I do think we have more to talk about. And I'd like to thank the listeners who took the time to be inspired and informed by you and to ask them to click subscribe. So wherever they listen to podcasts so that they can follow along and together, my hope is that all of us can change working lives for the better. You've been listening to the Psych Health and Safety Canada podcast. To stay up to date with the best content on workplace mental health in North America, subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and join the Flourish DX community at www.flourishdx.com.